All right, thanks to everyone for coming. Um, my name's Marty Corrigan. I think I know most people in the room, but um, 2017 uh, future leader and this year sitting on the committee um, as the project lead. So I'd first like to ask up our chairman of the Hunter Net Future Leaders Program, Tim Blakemore, to do a welcome. Thank you, Marty. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, future leaders, to our mentors who are scattered secretly in the room tonight and who will be introduced shortly, welcome. And thank you so much to the mentors for giving your time and being a part of this program. And welcome to our employer sponsors. I know most of you are in the room tonight. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you once again for your support of your own future leaders and without you, Supporting, oh, sorry, supporting um, the future leaders of the region, this project simply wouldn't exist. Um, and to our special guest speaker, Kyle Lodes. Welcome to the HunterNet Future Leaders project launch. It's a, really a pleasure to have you join us, and thanks for making yourself available and for sharing your insights and thoughts with us tonight. So, what a great turnout for a great night. I often think I sound a bit like a broken record when talking about this program because I can't help but talk about how far the whole thing has come in the five years it's been running. So to look out and see the calibre of people we have in the audience tonight is a testament to the reputation this program has earned over the years and something I'm very proud to be a part of. So here we are at a pivotal moment in the 2019 Future Leaders Program. The big reveal of the much anticipated project question. The teams have been carefully selected, the project brief carefully assembled, the build up and anticipation is now at peak levels and you can really feel the buzz and nervous energy in the room. So I'm not going to waffle on too much tonight but I do want to take just a couple of moments to talk quickly about the project itself because it's a critical part of the program and it's one that the participants say every year is a really challenging but also a very rewarding part of the whole program. What I personally love about the project each year is the fact that it's always tightly linked to our region, which I'm sure we're all pretty passionate about. But there's also the real world application of the project itself. And that, in fact, if it really is good enough, any project submission could theoretically be made a reality. I remember when I completed my project back in 2015, and I thought, and sorry, the thought that got me pretty excited was that there's a good chance, sorry, and that thought got me very excited. I think there's a good chance this year's participants will experience the same excitement, and that's a big part of what makes this project so great each and every year. So to the future leaders, as you embark on the next big and important part of this program, I urge you to give it your all. Yes, there will probably be times when you're tired and stressed, and let's be honest, just can't be bothered. But put in the effort and you'll reap the rewards. I hope that you enjoy the experience, make some new business connections and some friends for life, and most importantly, win. <laughs> no, as we all know, it's all about, it's not about winning, it's about the experience, of course. <laughs> but lastly, to my colleagues in the Future Leaders Committee, especially to Mar Marty Corrigan and the project committee who designed this year's project brief and who have organised tonight, thank you all once again for your amazing efforts in what you do pulling this all together. The program continues to go from strength to strength and it is a credit to you all, so thank you. So I'm gonna, that's all from me. I'm going to hand it to Marty. Thanks for all listening, and I'll hope you have a good night. Thank you. So firstly, what is the purpose of um, doing a project? So what, the first part of it is about applying the skills and learnings uh, from the program. So I've got up on the screen here uh, the 11 key topics that we've been through in the program, um, and I'm not going to go through them all tonight um, because I know you've still um, got a couple of sessions to go. But I suppose I, if, I, if I reach out to the, um, the participants, think about how you can apply in the real world some of the learnings that, um, that you have learnt. So think about how you can apply some of Wayne Pierce's um, uh, high performing team learnings, how you can apply that, um, that, that, that healthy challenge and how you can um, apply that to how your team goes about the project. Um, the second part of the project is about challenge. So the key um, purpose of this program is to grow each and every one of us as leaders and through challenge comes growth. So you're going to be challenged in different ways. You're going to be challenged through the project question itself, but you're also going to be challenged in coming together as a new team with all different personalities and people from different industries and people with different backgrounds um, to work together as a team in, in I suppose, quite an intense um, environment over 10 weeks. 
So we've touched on it um, a few times already this year, um, but the last part of the purpose of the project is to have benefit for the region. And this year our theme of our project is the continuation of the work um, of positioning Newcastle as a global second city. And I suppose there's been some really uh, robust discussion about that concept over the last few weeks. And I suppose my, my thoughts are that um, what this project will provide the participants is the chance to put their mark and have their say on the future of the region. Um, and I suppose I think that should really be our focus. It's about acknowledging where we are, but about having your say around what the future looks like. Um, so I'm now going to introduce Kyle Lodes, our guest speaker for tonight. Kyle is a chairman, non-executive director and advisor with more than two decades of experience, experience across commercial, community and public sectors. He has particular interest and experience in the transformation of businesses facing disruption. Kyle is currently a non-executive director of Credit Union Australia, chair of Drive Yellow, chair of Hunter Medical Research Institute, chair of the Australian Transformation and Turnaround Association, and a conjoint professor in the Faculty of Business and Law at the University of Newcastle. In December 2017, Kyle completed a three and a half year term as chairman of the NRMA, where he, direct, where he directed a period of significant cultural and operational change required uh, considerable strategy and risk expertise. In an executive capacity, he established and grew and managed an independent car broking business that disrupted the motor vehicle industry. The company was purchased by ASX listed AP Eagers. Cole is a fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the Australian Transformation and Turnaround Association. He completed an MBA at the University of Newcastle, a Harvard Business School certificate in disruptive strategy and transformational leadership program at the ANU. All this aside, I suppose I've heard, heard Kyle spoke, speak a few times over the years, um, and one thing that always strikes me is his passion, energy and commitment to not just um, business and leadership, but also the local region. So ladies and gentlemen, Kyle Lodes. Can we get rid of that? <laughs> That's the first, uh, I'm just going to, can you all hear me up the back? So I just thought I'd, I'd stand here and take away the barrier. Thanks so much, Marty, Chair Tim, and the committee and the alumni and the students, the participants in the course, and the other stakeholders, the, the companies that are really supporting this as well. There's a few oldies here like myself, but not many. And uh, I'm really excited about the vibe here. And when I was asked to speak, uh, I always do when I can, because I've benefited in so many ways from the knowledge from others. And when I speak, you'll hear of a common theme about knowledge, that you, whatever you know, got you today, and then you've got to keep learning to get you to tomorrow and ahead. So um, thanks so much for having me. So um, I didn't think about uh, speaking tonight until today. Uh, and uh, I'm in the car on the way home this afternoon to pick up my 16-year-old daughter, who rarely talks to me, you know, what did you learn today, Grunt? Nothing, you know. you know. But I said, okay, I've got to speak tonight on leadership. You know, what, what do you think about what it takes to be a good leader? And all of a sudden she sparked up and she said, you've got to be able to communicate at all levels, not just at the leader's level. I said, that's great. You've got to dress well, apparently. Yep, so that's good. <laughs> really important. You've got to be open-minded, not just stuck on one view. So that's, that's good. You've got to have a good sense of humour. That's really important. So I said, well, where do you school me out of all of those? She said, zero. <laughs> right? And I said, is, is that it? Is there anything else you need to be a successful leader? She said, yes. You have to have a full head of hair. <laughs> so I'm nowhere. I don't even deserve to be here before you. So it's a tough old world. But um, I said, well, we'll conjure up something anyway. So... Um, as per the introduction, I've been around here, born and bred, New Lambton, played at Newcastle. Uh, my world took me away living in Sydney, but always living here. So, and, and I think when I was in my mid-twenties, I started managing teams, and that meant I had to learn to manage uh, a new skill of managing others beyond what I, whatever I could do on my own. And that was a bit of a game changer for me, and looking at the the roles that many of you have, you're all early management, mid-management, and more likely aspirational to do more than that. Um, and I guess for me, 
I never had any grand plan. In my mid-20s to 30, I had no idea whatsoever that I ended up as chair of the NRMA, billion dollars of net assets, thousands of staff, 600 mil turnover. You know, it would have been not possible. Um, but it was more a view of how do I really nail this job? This is the job that I'm tasked to do. And if I do that above average, it may lead to other things, whatever that might be, and somehow joining the dots. So I'm going to probably talk about some things which I've been asked to do about my experience that you may not see in some of the theory uh, along. But there's a, there's a general thing about how do I get the knowledge to outperform? And, and that's a common theme through all the things that I've done. I ended up working for a number of companies and I always wanted to do my own thing. And as one of the, the startup I started, one person myself, um, that was auto advantage. And the thing about that as a business, and whether it's your own business as a startup or innovation within a corporate, uh, doesn't matter. You've got to come up with the right idea to start with. And, and I guess that's a form of innovation. For me, as I was looking, uh, I, I joined the dots from mortgage broking and the evolution of mortgage brokers and how mortgage brokers became an independent advisor. And uh, in some ways, people didn't always want to go directly to a financial institution, um, but they went to mortgage broking. And I thought, wow, if that works there, why couldn't it work in other areas? And I started exploring different industries. So it was joining the dots of a trend and then taking it elsewhere. And that ended up in the motor vehicle procurement, uh, which is where it landed. And when I looked around the world, uh, it hadn't happened to any great degree. So that's what I did. I joined the dots and started from scratch. Um, and then it was about the right idea, because people didn't really want to go buy a car, but then how did people know about you and learning the market? And what I loved about the market opportunity was that it was massive. Because um, there were 40,000 cars a year bought in the Hunter and zero from a broker. Massive upside. I only one half the market thanks. Um, later on, others followed, but there's a few characteristics of the right idea. You don't want lots and lots of competition. Um, then it was learning uh, to go beyond yourself and to fund it right. And I think if I learned anything when I could sell it eventually, it was that why it was bought from a listed company, because I made it not about me. It was about the business, the people, the systems. So every weekend, I used to pay people to come in and write the systems so that there was an operation system, sales and marketing, et cetera, et cetera, the McDonald's franchise. Because you've got nothing to sell as an asset if it's about the individual that starts it. I needed more knowledge of how to scale. So I used to get up and drive to Sydney to listen to John Simon, Mark Boris and others for a breakfast meetings and then come back to work. So I'd drive for two and a half, two and a half hours, be there for an hour, hopefully meet them, be inspired by them, but learn the knowledge and I always ask questions. So to me it was that how do you get the knowledge so you can fast track growth. Um, eventually, after one year, uh, the right, this great idea, nice strategy, it all went, you know, we all have big problems that happen in life, in your business, your own business or elsewhere, that ran out of cash. Right? So here I am, I've hocked against the house, my wife Denise, and myself have had a child, so there's no other income, and I ran out of cash. I'm paying a wage of one other person on a credit card. And some other things happened which added to that. But ultimately, what are you going to do? Is this the end, or do you find another way? And what I did, I joined the dots of what, what knowledge can I get? And I, I remember hearing someone here who listed a company, who was 10 or 15 years older than me, that when he listed the company, there was no knowledge in Newcastle for that, went to Melbourne to get the knowledge, came back and listed it, because he went and got the knowledge. And I thought, okay, who else has got the knowledge of what I need? And there was one other person in Queensland. I flew up there and said, we should work together. There's only a few of us. And it gave me the idea of what to do next, which changed the business model. I brought in an investor, uh, and then it gave me the cash flow to get me to where I needed to go. And I got up earlier in the morning to find the mark, because really it was a low cost base business but a fixed cost base. So all I needed was more sales and more revenue to get through that. And then 
eventually it come good and I added on more people, more scale, took it national, and that was the business that I sold. And there's a lot more in that, but I'm giving you a, a very short and but I had to find the knowledge for the different stages. Uh, and that was a very different skill set to when I was an employee for others. Um, throughout my whole working life from mid-twenties through to now, obviously more than that, uh, I, I was on surf club committee, helicopter board, uh, and other boards, the Hunter Business Chamber board. And all of those things helped me get more knowledge of how to govern correctly how to manage and work around others, how to deliver to the community, that the stakeholders around, just like here, just by being around them gave me more knowledge. So every year I did stuff, I learnt more by putting myself out there. So if I just stayed in a cocoon hoping to learn more uh, just from reading, you're never going to get there as quick. Uh, so eventually that led me to the chamber board, I become chair. And then the NRMA role, which I, I opened up the open road and had calling for nominations to be a board member. And I thought, well, I can do that. I'm in the car industry. I'm used to advocating and lobbying. Why don't I give that a go? But you had to get elected. So I put a team around me to get elected, a former politician, a marketing person, and another person that had great networks. And I spent four months putting that team together so that I got elected. Because if you're going to put your name out there, you've got to win. And this winning thing has come up here a bit earlier. Anyway, I won. I got elected. <laughs> then, I had to, then when I got on that board, they said, oh, you know something about cars? We've just acquired thrifty car rentals. We're going to put you on that board. So all of a sudden, I've gone from a, a smaller business world to another business world, which was like the stratosphere for me. But it didn't daunt me. I, I, I think uh, what I thought was, OK, now I need to learn really quickly to contribute at this level. Um, and how do, I, how do I find those answers? Eventually, uh, I became the chair of the NRMA. And that was something that I didn't plan. I've never planned any of this. It was just something that sort of evolved. But as I was coming into the chairmanship of NRMA about five years ago, the business was plateauing. So people don't buy cars anymore uh, to the same degree because of don't get an Uber and others, or if they do, cars break down less. Why do I need a roadside service organisation? And then what's coming was a sharing economy, and then the ultimate, the driverless car, wipes you out. So if you don't need to own a car anymore, you definitely don't need the NRMA. 300 of 600 mil turnover, 50% of the revenue is at risk. And you can't drop your cost base by that. So as a chair coming into it, I thought, right, I could cruise and go to lots of lunches and leave this for others in the future, or we can have a crack at really setting this business has been around for a hundred years. So a startup 95 years ago, right, turned into a plateauing business but successful that will more likely die in the future. So then what have we got to do to ensure that it's going to be around another hundred years? So then, that was a knowledge that I didn't have, frankly, right? But I, I was, and this is one of the crucial things that I think I'd encourage all of us, it's disrupt or be disrupted. So wherever you think we're going well, there's something else coming for you that wants to challenge that. So while it's looking good, is the time that you need to be looking uh, elsewhere. So effectively, in a nutshell, change the, the board, because you need the capability and knowledge, the CEO, 30 out of 40 managers, stopped businesses, started new ones, and set a strategy of the future, which I haven't got time to talk about now. But ultimately it worked, and really diversified in a short period of time. And during that time, going through that, I went looking for knowledge. So I went looking for who has been through disruption, eyeballed it, and dealt with what you do to change successfully, or if you failed, what did you learn from it? And I spoke to hundreds of people who were senior leaders, because the NRMA name got me into some of those conversations, so that I could start to develop the knowledge. I did more education in this space, etc. I didn't just wing it. You can't. But I, it didn't daunt me that I didn't know the answers. So one of my things that's really important is to have a go. Don't worry about not knowing it all. Good leaders know where to find the answers. But have a go. Too many people stop at a level where 
they think that's their knowledge level and they don't, they don't know enough to go beyond that. So what I would say to all of you is keep going uh, because you've just got to know how to find the answers and, and it's all possible. So the transformation uh, theme is so important to me personally and I, have a, I was lucky to go around the world. I'm not, really not here to talk about me, but, but by going to other places gave me knowledge that I didn't get here. When you sit in the Google car, you know that it's going to wipe out the car manufacturing and all these other industries and also the way houses are, are powered, so two industries. And then the flow on effect is so significant, so if you're not looking at it, um, it's just going to take you out. I've learned so much about as a leader, if you're going to go through change, so what are the things you have to get right? And some of those are, and I have a, some of you have heard me say this before, and I tend to dumb it down to strategy, implementation of strategy. So you've got the right strategy, but poorly execute, you fail. Wrong strategy, but perfectly execute, you fail. If you've got the right strategy and are executing well, but then something else comes up to upset it and you're not agile enough to change, you fail. But you've got to start with the right strategy. You've got a core business that may or may not die. How do we add other things with your brand and capability to add to that so that you can survive even if your core business is going to go backwards one day? That's the stuff that if I'm your chair or your CEO, I want you coming to me with and saying, hey, we're going really well, but have you seen this? Here's the impact and here's what I'm thinking we should do about it. So I actually don't want me to be dragging that out of you. I want you to push me. That's another thing that I would advise all of you when you're looking at your leadership aspirations and capabilities. Don't have be having to drag along. And I know the fact you're here means there's good odds of that. Right? I want you, you've got to push. And even if it's culturally they don't want to know, they're going to want to know if you make them look good one day. Purpose and values driven in terms of change. So by the time I started with all this, purpose and values was nowhere. Now it's at front and centre. What's the purpose? It matters. What are the values that we're going to work to? The no compromise areas. And if you don't actually work around those through all the change, it won't be effective. Capability. I think all of us as leaders need to be really honest about our individual knowledge and capability and know what you've got to balance around. So you can either upskill and improve yourself or when you're building teams around you, you're actually balancing the teams around your weaknesses. But if you're not doing that, you're not going to get the high performance team supporting you to go where you need to go. And otherwise, who do you partner with? Because a lot of the times it's supposedly all about what do we do within a business? But these, these um, Amazons of the world and other platforms that are technology and partner with others to supply mean that you don't actually have to do it all yourself. In fact, who you partner with is crucial to, to and what labelling. So in financial services that I'm in, if we're really good at what we do, we can supply financial services to another brand. They use their brand for their client base using this business and we scale as well as our own direct to market. There's so many strategies. Again, I haven't got time. So business models, platform businesses, ecosystems, you've got to know all this. Um, it's not a lot of knowledge. Some in the hunter know all this, I know, but many don't. It's the sort of level you need to keep looking for. I love I love the platform businesses who decades ago, 20 years ago, they were nowhere. All of a sudden, an Amazon starts and starts sending books and CDs around the world. And all of a sudden, they're taking over whole industries. So when you're looking at opportunities and threats, right, the threat is often you're looking at threats within your own industry. But that's too narrow. You've actually got to look at the trends, the mega trends around the world some of these businesses that are gobbling up companies, cutting across industries, start here and cut across. And when Amazon says, we're in financial services, when Amazon says we're going to be number one in home loans in the US, there's good odds that's going to happen. What are the odds they're going to be doing that here? Where if you know that, and I'm in financial services, what am I going to do to adjust? Maybe I'll partner with them, 
Maybe I'll adjust my business to bulletproof it so when that happens, it doesn't matter. But staying the same is almost certain uh, you're gonna go backwards if not die in the future. And I guess the reality is in this complex world, when you start looking at AI, machine learning, robotics, you know, they're opportunities or threats. So, but they're enablers. So a lot of people think they're the solutions. They're just enablers. What it's really about is people and culture and how the people within the culture work with the fancy things, the innovation, the startups, the robotics, the big data. And above all, you've got to put the customer right at the middle. And too often legacy organisations, they start out with the right service, but then don't revisit the customer. Are we actually delivering for the customer? And sometimes the customer doesn't know. And I sort of say, if you think of the horse and cart time, 100 years ago, so if you said to the horse and the customers, what do you want? The horse and cart people would go, give me a cheaper whip, give me cheaper oats, when the car was just coming over the hill that nobody could see. So sometimes the customer doesn't know. You've got to be looking for what's coming outside your industry and join the dots and use it in parallel to the good things that you're doing. So the platform businesses don't have what we all have with our legacy organisations. We've got brand, we've got proven capability, we've got staff, we've got customers, we've got systems. Yet they're coming out and, and taking some of us out. So why can't legacy companies do both? So why can't you maintain all the good things and incorporate those other things that they're good at? It's possible. The good ones are already doing this. The other thing is changing customer expectations. So you used to be able to just deliver a product or service at a price and, and stay in touch with people and it was all hunky dory. But now people want things quicker, cheaper, faster, more add-ons. So the consumers expect more, particularly with technology. But the other thing is then when you add in, where's the company on environmental issues with diversity of gender, of sexual orientation, of other uh, di diversity? Um, there's all these things that need to be understood and marketed so that your members know and your customers know. And if you're not, if you're just producing uh, a vanilla service uh, and you're not good at the rest, it won't be enough. So what does this mean here? Because I've, I've got to end. Um, as a mid, uh, early to mid-tier managers, um, I suppose the continuing learning, so if you've done an undergraduate degree or a master's, often that's where it ends. Maybe by your 30s, right? And then you, where's the rest of the knowledge gonna come from? The fact you're here is fantastic. And I'll come back to this group uh, in a minute. But a continual learning mindset, never think you know it all, because even if you do, which is rare, it only got you to today. Because there's something else you need to learn. I would say what drove me early was to outperform my current role. So what does outperform mean? So we get KPIs, all of us. So when you at budget time, incremental growth is not enough. Outperformance, when you think of Silicon Valley thinking, 10 times more. You've got to think bigger. And if you deliver halfway, you're five times more, still better than average. So adopt that sort of philosophy and work out how to do it. So I said earlier, great, great leaders don't know all the answers, how to do 10 times more, but others do. And I think that's what you're putting together this year. Be honest about your strengths and weaknesses, it's really honest. It's hard to do. Um, get others to assess you, but self-assessment's the best. We all know. I know my strengths and weaknesses, uh, absolutely, but I've tried to build uh, teams around me. And, and ultimately, go for it. You know, um, in, I find in the Hunter uh, pockets of innovation, uh, pockets of we've done really well, and a lot of, there's not a lot of need to change. I suspect less amongst this group, but with 20,000 businesses plus in the Hunter, it's been built on a lot of history um, not a lot of innovation and new thinking statistically. That'll come home and be a risk in the future. The fact you're all here means the odds are up of yourself individually and the organisations you work for currently or others in the future um, thinking way beyond that. Um, 
So I love what this group's about. I never got to work with anything like that. So um, in terms of the alumni coming back, the, the initial cohort, you know, that's great that you're investing your personal time back. This, this could turn into thousands of people. Now, can you imagine that? What the power is of that knowledge of thousands of people here that are going to go forth and conquer within all your organisations and then lead into other aspects of the region, which I'm going to lead to next. So I love what you're doing. Um, giving back is something that's been really important to me. Uh, how do we, when we, um, if we go on a ride, how do we look after others is a really important um, mandate uh, for me. And when I come back from living in Sydney full time with NRMA, um, I come back to the uni and I started a role there. And working with Kate and Will at the, the research centre has been really important with that. That led to the Second City Symposium. Many of you were there, um, which was about collaboration, some of the outcomes, brand and identity, more infrastructure. But what I really liked was livability, because often the focus is on infrastructure. We need more roads and transport, we're all good. Is that it? What about to live here? What have we got with nighttime economy, arts and culture? gender diversity things and issues. What are we really doing to support that? And they're the issues that matter to the next generations to come and work here, live here, and stay here. That's why I'm here tonight, because I want to harness this and support it, and that's what the Research Centre of the University is about. And how do you benchmark that against best practice around the world? So there's a lot of collaboration going on. So all the organisations that have got mostly oldies like me, with them, the Hunter Joint Organisation of Councils, HCCDC, the Development Corporation, RDA Hunter, and some of the other big corporates, they're all getting together finally, and there's now a, um, and Hunter Net, and there's now a committee for the Hunter, which finally is getting together, and some of you may know about that, which is about one voice for the region, uh, asking those that need to get support the region, governments and others, here's the one voice, we represent the region, is what we want to make it a great place to invest, live and visit. Um, the Second City Symposium um, is coming again. Um, in the meantime, there's been an identity and positioning issue. What came out of the, the symposium was, what are we known for? We couldn't say. So we're working on that at the moment. And I'm excited to hear that result at the end of the year. The next symposium is called Smaller and Smarter Cities which will be much more about how do we really start to diversify the region through all the change coming. Jobs of the future. Some of the mega trends I was talking about earlier are going to impact on every business, every industry here. What are we doing to understand that, plan for that? And so that the transition of the existing workers um, works, that there's jobs for all. And what are the new jobs that are going to replace the ones that disappeared? Um, and it will also delve into in many respects, the challenges and opportunities that we are definitely going to have. Let's get on the front foot. Not dissimilar to the time I spent at the NRMA. You could easily cruise. The longer you cruise and do less, means it's a greater risk later on where you've got less time to adjust. That's all coming up. What I'd encourage all of you to do is to get involved when you see it. And I know that between Will and Kate, there'll be communications to this cohort. Because um, your input, it's no use I'm not the future. I'm an oldie that's, that's around and I'll help. You're the future. And I personally and others here want to make sure that you are harnessed and supported to contribute for the region's benefit. And also the more knowledge that you learn through that will undoubtedly help yourselves individually and your organisations. So uh, I commend uh, the Chair, uh, Tim, Marty, and all of you here for your initiative. Thanks for having me tonight. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kyle. Um, so many gems in that, as always, and I think that that core message of, of how we can um, continue to learn and continue to strive, uh, we can all apply that in our in our work and in our leadership. And I certainly hope the um, participants can apply that in this year's project. Uh, next up, I have Kate Thompson to take us through the project context in question. Sorry. 
Well, I hope you're all um, listening because um, there were some gems in there and if you were listening, you probably have a good idea about where to go with your project already. So, um, <laughs> just gave all the answers. <laughs> well, that's fine, no worries. Um, you've got an interesting road ahead of you. I was a participant last year um, and the great thing about the project is you get to draw together all of the themes and all of the things that you've been learning about, as Marty said, um, throughout the program. Um, and this year, in particular, while, while it's always a key aim and a key goal of the project and the committee generally to bring something to the project which is tangible and there's an outcome there that might actually lead to real change for the region, I really think this year you've got more of an opportunity to do that than ever before. Um, like Carl said, um, like we'll talk about um, throughout the course of this discussion and then in the coming weeks, there are some really exciting opportunities for you guys to think about uh, what you do and as part of this project and becoming part of this, this discussion that we're having um, more broadly um, and as part of the deliverables for the Hunter Research Foundation Centre. So, what are we talking about? Uh, second cities, and I hope uh, you've already picked up on that. We've been giving you enough teasers throughout the course of the project, uh, the program so far to tell you that that was the direction in which we were heading. Um, when we talk about second cities, we're not talking about second tier or almost but not quite good enough. Um, what we're talking about are cities that might not be the capital city of the state or the region in which they're located or the nation, um, but which are nonetheless integral to the economic fabric and cultural fabric of those nations and are important in their own way. So we're not talking about not quite good enough, we're not talking about, um, you know, the, the runner-up in terms of the, the hierarchy in terms of the, the cities in New South Wales. We're just talking about cities which are special um, and important in and of their own right. So what are second cities? Uh, they're home to a significant proportion of the world's po population and they do represent, like I said, significant drivers of economic development and cultural identity. So when we're talking about second cities, we're not just talking about business and we're not talking about e economics and industry. Uh, and like Kyle said, we're talking about a whole range of things, cultural factors, social factors, livability. So um, if I can encourage you to take one thing away from, from the outset is that we're not just talking about business, we're not just talking about economic development or industrial development, we're actually talking about a wholesome perspective uh, for Newcastle but also the region as a whole. So common features are a population of between 50,000 and 1 million people, which I'll grant you is quite a large range. Um, but what we're talking about here is we're not talking about global metropolis, metropolitan um, cities in the, in the sense of Tokyo or Sydney or San Francisco. What we're talking about is a place like Newcastle um, and, and similar cities which you, as you go through your research project um, component you'll, you'll find out there's a lot of examples of these cities that have enough of a population to have a certain level of depth in terms of their economic development, industrial capacity and their cultural fabric as well. Um, but like I said, aren't those me mega um, metropolitan metropolitan centres either. So, Greater Newcastle is Australia's second, seventh largest city and like we saw in the wonderful Out of the Square Media um, video at the start, um, we're not just talking about Newcastle, we're talking about the region generally um, and the fact that it is actually a gateway for not only the Hunter but for northern New South Wales as well. Um, we of course have a rich industrial history, um, BHP, mining, construction still remain um, two of our important industries. Um, but what we're seeing is an economic transformation and with that a so social, educational and cultural transformation as well. So what we see and what the Hunter Research Foundation Centre sees um, is Newcastle being poised to capitalise on that potential as a global second city. So we're very, very fortunate this year, um, like we've, we've discussed already, to have partnered with the Hunter Research Foundation Centre um, and we're very um, honoured to have Will here with us today and Kate as well. Um, so what, what's come out of that is, like I said, an opportunity for what you develop and what you deliver in terms of your project to feed into the very important work um, that these guys are doing, that the Committee for the Hunter are doing, um, and as part of that broader conversation about what we want our region to look like moving forward. Um, and we're very grateful, as I said, for the support the centre has offered us um, in terms of the resources and the opportunities that you'll continue to have available to you guys as you move through the project as well. Um, and we'll talk to you more about those opportunities um, in due course. So I'd just like to particularly acknowledge that support and how grateful we are for that. So like we've, um, like we've heard from Kyle, we did have the Second City Symposium um, in October of last year. There will be another one this year as well if you're particularly um, fired up about the issue and want to get involved in a um, more broad way in this, in this topic and as part of the development of the, um, the, the thought leadership in this area. 
Um, and coming out of that, we had a number of um, stakeholder groups, um, individuals, businesses, not-for-profits, um, various sectors of the society, of society and the economy, um, who came together to develop these um, six um, key goals and aims and aspirations, essentially, um, for the region. So the first one there, as you can see, was a compelling vision. Um, so like Carl said, and, and like I think um, we could all perhaps identify, um, we all kind of know where we live, we know what our natural attributes are in terms of um, you know, the, the wonderful landscape we have here, the, the sort of environmental factors that make this a really great place to, to live and work. But how do we talk about that? What's, what's brand Newcastle essentially? Um, and, and if you don't have brand Newcastle, or if you don't have a clear concept of what that looks like, how do we move forward into developing Newcastle and the Greater Hunter region um, as this, this second city, as this region which should be developed and grown um, in, the, in the coming decades? So that's our first one. The second one um, was clear brand and identity. So talking about, well, how do we distill our vision into a clear brand and identity? What does that look like? And we'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so the progress of key infrastructure was very important and identified um, in particular uh, as one of those um, things which is obviously necessary to en encourage and support the economic development of the region. And when we talk about key infrastructure, we're not just talking about roads, rail, we're talking about the airport, we're talking about the health precinct at the John Hunter Hospital, um, education and those other key institutions or hero institutions uh, that Newcastle and the Greater Hunter need to capitalise on uh, to ensure our economic development. Enhanced livability was the fourth one, which is including inclusi inclusivity. Um, so like we were talking about, we don't want a, um, a, a homogenous idea of what Newcastle is um, as just focusing on our economic identity. We want to talk about social and cultural factors and the fabric as well, um, and encourage diversity. So a space for everyone to have a say and have um, a role to play in what Newcastle looks like and what that second city ultimately becomes. We have as well uh, economic and cultural diversification. So like we've been talking about, you know, we have a rich industrial history here in Newcastle, but like Kyle was saying, that's not going to be enough. We're not going to be able to, to rely on our mining and manufacturing uh, industries moving forward if we're intending to capitalise on our um, economic depth um, and ensure that we actually have jobs to keep people, keep young people here um, in, the, in the future as well. So what does diversification look like in an economic sense, but also in a cultural sense? And then finally, um, as with all good um, research and, and development undertakings, we need to be able to measure where we are and where we're going. Um, and those things also um, talk about a healthy sense of competition. So what are our competitors doing? Um, and that's something I'd encourage you to look at when you start to look at your idea for the project is there's lots of really exciting examples around the world of second cities um, who are doing some really exciting things that will help to inspire what we can do in here in Newcastle. All right, so the question. Yeah, I feel like we need a drum roll or something, Marty. Okay, so we have two components to the question this year. So the first one is to consider the vision and branding for the Greater Newcastle Region and how it can be used to promote Newcastle and the region as a global second city. So this, the first component of that is to develop an identity and positioning concept for the Greater Newcastle Region, which promotes it as a global second city. Now, I'm not a marketing person, I will freely and, and happily admit that, but when we're talking about that first concept, we're sort of talking about a traditional understanding of a brand, but in a much more broad sense than that. So we're not just talking about, um, you know, fancy fonts and logos, although that is part of the component for the question, as you will see in your um, project brief, as having a visual representation of your concept ultimately, but talking about what all of those factors that we've been discussing today. So what is, what is the spirit of Newcastle? What's the concept and what's the identity that if we sit around and talk about if Newcastle was a person, who would that person be? What would we talk about as being their strengths and weaknesses? So the second part of the question, once you've identified and developed your brand and identity positioning concept, um, is to identify an ASX 200 listed company which your team believes should establish a new headquarters in Newcastle with the aim to improve the economic diversity of the region. So using that positioning and using that work that you've done in that first part of the question, moving then to go, 
what are we actually going to do in a concrete sense? So we need anchor um, entities, anchor industries and anchor businesses to help Newcastle on the path to becoming a global second city. So what does that look like for you? Is that a health business? Is it an education business? Is it a cultural business? Um, and again, if you when you start to look at these sorts of things, you'll see there's some really interesting research and work that's being done globally um, with companies like Amazon um, identifying and picking non-traditional areas for their headquarters because they recognise the capacity and the potential of global second cities as well um, and, and the, the importance of investing in those non-traditional, so non-metropolitan um, areas and non-capital cities. Um, and also, so the second part of that, so for you, for you uh, non-creative people like myself, um, that has a sort of a more um, business planning and, and strategic planning element to it as well, as you'll see when we start to talk about the um, marking criteria, which I believe my colleague Jason is going to speak to you about now. Thanks, Kate. So, um, as you, oh, let me go back. as usual, there's four um, components to this year's project. Uh, the first component is a 25-page written report, um, which will consist of two components. So, it's a maximum of 25, but part one of the question will have a maximum of five pages, and part two, um, 20 pages. Um, there'll be a 30-minute presentation to a panel of esteemed judges, which will be announcing by um, my colleague Sarah shortly. Um, a 200 word summary to be um, presented um, in the program for the gala dinner. And uh, this year it's only a two minute elevated pitch, which you'll present at the gala dinner in October. Uh, the judging criteria for this uh, year's program is um, the project idea and proposal of part one of the question will be worth 10% and the ASX 200 company that you select will be worth 10%. The written report will consist of the concept and research at 15%, innovative, creative and practicality 15% and the business and strategy plan of 20%. And then the team presentation, your delivery is 20% and your team cohesiveness and culture will be 10%. The all important dates. So the project will be um, due on, I think it's Thursday the 10th of October at five o'clock. Um, your 200 word gala summary is the following day. Um, presentation media will be due on the 23rd with uh, the project presentation the following day. And the gala dinner where we'll announce the winner will be on the 25th of October. Do you want to? I'll hand back over to Marty. All right, all good. So I didn't mention before, thanks, Jase. Um, but we've got everyone a project brief here, so you don't have to worry about writing anything down. You'll, you'll get all that tonight. All right, thanks, Jase. And then all important uh, judges, teams, and mentors announcement, uh, Sarah. Thank you. All. Oh. all right. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed judging panel and team mentors for this year's project. Um, so our 2019 judging panel is diverse, has a wealth of knowledge and experience within the Hunter region are, and are all leaders in their own right. So as you can see on, see on the slide, our judges are Tony Cade, who is the CEO of HunterNet, Kari Armitage, Managing Director of Quarry Mining, Kyle Lodes, our fantastic guest speaker this evening, Michelle McPherson, the Chief Financial Officer of NIB Health Funds, and Prem Chand, the CEO of Roadhound Electronics. Um, so I'm going to introduce our team mentors now. I'll read out the bios first, um, and then I'll get them all to come up, and then we'll in, like link you up to your team. So, mentors. So our first mentor is Tim Donahue. So Tim is the general manager of Tunra, which is the commercial arm of the university, and has worked in the research and development sector for over 15 years. Tim's background is in engineering, completing both a bachelor's degree and a PhD at the University of Newcastle. Tim's main experience is in the provision of specialised consultancy services to the resource sector and has worked with both small and large companies. In addition to his technical expertise, Tim has also experience in teaching both undergraduate and postgraduate students, as well as industry personnel, including tradesmen, maintenance staff, design engineers and senior managers. 
Tim's leadership experiences encompasses business development, strategy planning, budgeting, budgeting and the development and implementation of business plans. Tim is also a 2018 Future Leader alumni. Um, our second mentor is Warwick Summer. Warwick was appointed as the Chief Operating Officer of AMP Control in March 2018 after joining the company in July 2017. Warwick has over 20 years of industry experience across the legal, manufacturing and logistics se sectors. Prior to rejoining AMP Control, Warwick held a number of senior management, management positions within Asiano, including General Manager of Peter, uh, Patrick Steve Dory. Um, in his role as Chief Operating Officer, Warwick draws on his experience in logistics and commercial disciplines to be able to develop business strategy and deliver on strategic objectives. Warwick holds a Bachelor of Industrial Engineering from the University of Newcastle, Bachelor of Laws from Macquarie University, Graduate Diploma of Management in Technology Management from Deakin University, and a Graduate Diploma of Legal Practice from the New South Wales College of Law. All right. Our third mentor, Ian Wynn. Ian is a former CEO with more than 15 years in senior leadership roles in high growth companies, working with a range of boards, founders and private equity. During this time, he was involved in two equity buyouts and successfully managed the transition to new owners. Most recently, he was the CEO of Smartline Personal Mortgage Advisors, a franchise mortgage broking business with over 320 franchises and a loan book of $26 billion. Prior to Smartline, he was the CEO of Aporto, an Australian franchise fast food business with $150 million retail sales, which was owned by private equi equity company Archer Capital. Before Aporto, he was the coup at Sumo Salad for its startup years and was instrumental in the growth of Sumo Salad from 10 stores to over 100 stores and retail sales of $80 million. Earlier in his career, he trained as an accountant as Coopers and Librand and then spent 10 years at Unilever in a range of commercial and sales roles in Australia and overseas. From Unilever, he joined Yum Brands where he moved into the fast food franchise industry and cutting his teeth in operations. Post Smartline, he now holds non-executive director roles in chairs and advisory board, all in the healthcare industry. He is also the founder of a startup providing timely and transparent financial reporting and benchmarking for franchise groups. The purpose is to develop an environment and provide the data where franchises and franchisees can work together in improving all stakeholders' profitability. And our final mentor is Rebecca Johnston. Rebecca is a planning and development professional with 20 years experience across local and state governments in the private sector. The first half of her career was spent in local government in Northwest Sydney, Sydney with a focus on strategic land use, planning, policy development and project delivery. A chance to move to Newcastle saw Rebecca take the position of planning manager for the Port of Newcastle. The role involved devising effective land use strategies to achieve the business's outcomes, facilitating infrastructure and development approvals and long-term master planning for the Port. More recently, Rebecca has been appointed to the role of principal planner at Bar Property and Planning, a boutique planning consultancy where she was responsible for delivering projects from inception through to completion. One of the lovely parts of her job is being able to support and encourage young planners in the business to grow in their confidence and skills. She has an honours degree in town planning, qualifications in project management, and is currently undertaking her master's in business administration at the University of Newcastle as a Wimba scholar. Most importantly, she was a Future Leaders program participant in 2016, a winning project team member and former Future Leaders committee member. She's very excited to be able to continue her association with, pro with the program this year as a team mentor. So Marty, Kate, Jason and myself, we're all very excited to have our mentors on board for the 2019 project and thank you for their support and involvement this year. I have no doubt you are all agreeing that our participants are in very good hands this year. So if I... Yep. <laughs> Um, so if I could just get our four mentors to come up to the front and we will announce the teams. Um, and so once we've done that, Marty will just do a quick close and then you'll break off into your rooms where you'll get your project brief and have some team time. So Ian's team is Nicholas Olivieri, Andrew Fisher, Chanel Egan, Brody White, Samuel Noakes and Dr. Bin Chen. 
Rebecca's team, Michelle Curtis, Michelle Richards, Kane Rathbone, Joe Dowling, Scott Robertson. Tim's team, Robert Russell, Rachel Callaghan, Hayley Parsons, Aaron Curtis, Jared Fair and Scott Baker. And finally, Warwick's team, Ashley McKellar, Timothy Higgins, Bridget Anderson, Naran Varma, Baha, Chaichi and Reese Marini. So I'll pass over to Marty, who'll do a quick close and then um, you guys can have some team time. Thanks, Sarah. All right, well, thank you very much. I'll be quick. Um, thank you very much for everyone coming along tonight. Um, I'm sure um, the teams are extremely excited and uh, thankful to have such excellent mentors on board, and so are we, as um, Sarah mentioned. Um, Mayors will just be out the door, and as we finish up, um, you can all just follow your mentor. There's four rooms just across the hall here, um, and you can all follow your mentors across into those rooms to spend some time um, getting to know each other. So on behalf of everyone at the Future Leaders Committee, thank you very much, and just Mayors may be reminded me to say everyone needs to leave out the back door because the front door shut so thank you very much and have a good night